Hollywood Crime Scene. I am your host, Joe Hollywood. And once again, I'm joined by Imaginos Pete. Hey, hey. And Andrew, Detective Aberline Walker. Minus the opium. <laughs> it gives you uh, the ability to <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. see things yes. into the future. Take you an advantage. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we're going to deviate a little bit from our normal... Uh, themes, even though uh, this is going to kind of connect to Hollywood uh, at the end there. But uh, today's theme is Jack the Ripper. And uh, I found out after we had decided that we were going to do this as a topic, uh, it's weird how the universe works because next week uh, is the 135th anniversary of his first Cannon murder. Right. So it's odd that the anniversary is within a few days of us doing this podcast. Mm -hmm. um, so as uh, you may or may not know, if you've even just casually followed Jack the Ripper, uh, there were a series of very gruesome murders that took place in the Whitechapel area of London. I don't want to get into too much detail about the gruesomeness of the murders. That's a little bit much. Um, but there's been a fascination with Jack the Ripper uh, 135 years later. And I think the main reason is that he has never been caught. The crimes have not been solved. And there's all kinds of room, room for speculation as to who was behind this. Was it a single individual? Was it a gang? Was it the royal family? Um, and that's what has kept this in the spotlight for 135 years is the speculation. Uh, it seems like when, when things go unsolved, like the Black Dahlia or whatever, that just seems to cause it to linger in the public eye for a long, long time. Uh, so like I said, you know, 135 years ago, uh, on fr uh, Friday, August 31st, 1888, uh, Marianne Nichols uh, was found in Bucks Row in the Whitechapel District. Now, there had been several murders uh, prior to the discovery of Marianne Nichols' body, Authorities sort of ruled out those um, as being connected to Jack the Ripper because the, the means of the death were slightly different than what we're going to be calling the five, I want to make sure I pronounce this right, canonical, yes. canonical yeah. victims, five canon victims. Um, so if there was any slight deviation from Jack the Ripper's uh, mode of uh, operation, uh, they sort of, authorities kind of separated those. But it's shocking to think that during a relatively small stretch of time that there were a lot of murders going on in London's uh, Whitechapel area. Yeah. And what they call, again, I hope I'm pronouncing this correct, Spitalfields, S-P-I-T-A-L-F-I-E-L-D-S. Mm -hmm. That was right in the area of Whitechapel as well. Um, so, yeah, so there were several murders before that. There were several murders after the last uh, official murder, um, but authorities kind of rule those out. Um, but we're, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. But first, we're going to talk about the canonical victims. Uh, so Marianne Nichols was the first official victim. Uh, then just a, a week or so later, Saturday, September 8th, 1888, Annie Chapman was found in the backyard of 29 Hanbury Street. Uh, she was uh, seen with a dark-haired man wearing a deer stalker hat and dark overcoat. Now, if, if you're trying to picture what a deer stalker hat looks like, picture Sherlock Holmes. It's one of those hats that has like a brim in the front and the back. Right. You could almost picture him with a pipe. Uh, so that was one witness description of the, the man that Annie Chapman was last seen with. I've heard it rudely referred to as the mullet hat. <laughs> party in the front <laughs> business in the back um so then just a few weeks after that on sunday september 30th uh elizabeth stride and Catherine eddowes were killed within an hour of each other now elizabeth stride was the first one found and due to lack of 
uh, mutilation similar to the other victims, uh, either she was not ruled canon or what most people think is it's theorized that uh, he was interrupted, that he had killed her and was ready to commence his uh, his usual thing. And maybe maybe a police patrol interrupted him. Maybe a couple came strolling by. Uh, so she was killed but not mutilated. But just an hour later, Catherine Eddowes was found not too far from that location with uh, Jack the Ripper's uh, signature trademark. And so they're thinking that he was interrupted uh, murdering Elizabeth Stride, but then got his uh, fix on Catherine Eddowes. Now, an interesting footnote with Catherine Eddowes, and I think this was addressed in the movie uh, From Hell uh, with Johnny Depp, is that a, a section of her bloodied apron was found near some graffiti on the wall, and the graffiti read, uh, the Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing, which I think is a triple negative. Yeah. <laughs> and people aren't sure if the killer left that apron there and then wrote the graffiti on the wall, or that if he just happened to drop it by a wall that happened to have some graffiti on it. Um, but the police commissioner at the time, Charles Warren, was afraid that uh, there might be some retaliation thinking that Jewish people might have had anything to do with this. So despite the fact that it might have been evidence, he ordered his officers to wash it off the wall. Um, and so, Andrew, you just recently watched From Hell. Do you remember them addressing that, that graffiti on the wall? Briefly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was just briefly touched yeah. on in that in that movie. Yeah. Uh, and so that was uh, victims three and four. And then the last uh, canonical victim, I like saying that, uh, was Friday, November 9th. Now, keep in mind, an entire month went by without a death attributed to Jack the Ripper. And people aren't quite sure why that happened. Um, you know, he's he's doing his thing. He's not getting caught. It's weird that he would take a month off. Um, but the final official victim was found on November 9th, Mary Jane Kelly was found, uh, and this is this is a, a weird thing because the other victims had been found outside. Uh, this victim, Mary Jean Kelly, was found in her own bed in her one-room uh, apartment, basically, where she lived uh, and was found just, you know, mutilated beyond recognition in her bed, which was sort of odd for Jack the Ripper. And they speculate that without fearing interruption, without fearing witnesses or bystanders he just uh let loose on mary jane kelly and and the there's pictures that you can see online that are just horrific that he just really took his time with her it's just absolutely horrific um so those are the five uh victims that are attributed to jack the ripper but like i said there were there were many murders before then and after then uh including the murder of a seven-year-old boy named john gill who had a lot of the earmarks of a Jack the Ripper killing, but for whatever reason, they ruled that one out, uh, even though it, it, he incurred the same damage that some of those other victims uh, had received. So, so those are the five main victims. Um, what do you? What are your thoughts on that? Like, do, do you think it's likely that these five victims were all killed by the same person, or do you, do you have any thoughts on whether it was multiple people? Andrew, when did you go go first on this one? What are your thoughts? I I think it's it's just one person uh, from a guy from upper crust society who I guess similar similar to uh, the previous guy we talked about, Ed Gein, who oh sure the leather uh, Leatherface was based off of yeah, yeah. Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Although he got caught and was from a lower social econ- social economic place, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, I. I, I couldn't. I couldn't guess on who exactly it would be. Yeah, They're, they they basically are saying that for someone to be able to get away with these murders and and disappear so quickly after the you know the bodies were discovered, that he had to have had knowledge of the streets. Yes, probably had access to one or more rooms where he can open a door disappear off the street very very quickly okay. had, had to have known the area to to be able to escape authorities maybe even knowing that the the police rounds and and when they were between rounds that he was able to pull something like that off i think we talked about this off off air mm-hmm. and i 
I'm inclined to agree with Andrew that it, it was someone from upper crust. Now, some arguments have been made that, oh, this person had to have independent knowledge, so it someone, it's someone from there because they knew every little place, they knew everything. But yet, everyone from there is from lower socioeconomic areas, so then they tend, tend to generalize them. Well, they don't have the intelligence to pull something off because you have to remember every cop's rotation. Mm -hmm. You have to know which buildings were unoccupied at what time, which had the least foot traffic, and how not to get caught. That's right. not someone who just looks some random yokel on the street. Right. Yeah. Was, and then the nature of the of the Yeah, it's I, I didn't look at a map of where Whitechapel is compared to other neighborhoods of the city. It, it, like maybe it, it was bordering a wealthy area and Well, I don't the, know. The, I, the killer could could quickly take come and go, yeah. Yeah. London like was, like a gross point versus right. Detroit or something. Well, London, yeah, yeah. London was very organized in that aspect of like class society. Like you would you didn't have a slum right next door to Okay. Like there, there was some partition because they. That's why when you saw someone, when they saw some someone with means coming by, you know, with a with a nice top hat and a and a coat, you're like, oh, that gentleman's here for something, yeah. drugs, women, <laughs> one or two things, or he's conducting some shady business with some gangs yeah. on how to move contraband. Like there's no there's no reason a well to do gentleman or or lady will be there in those areas. Like they'll stand yeah. out like a sore thumb. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Andrew, I think you're, what you're trying to say is, did London have the equivalent of Eight Mile? Right. Because right. <laughs> Eight Mile is like that hard cutoff yeah. where I, Coleman Young at one time was proposing building a wall or something to separate Eight Mile from Detroit from the suburbs. But sure. Yeah. So let's move on to the suspects. I read that at one point there were over 100 suspects that had been named throughout the investigation. Wow. Uh, Prince Albert Victor was one of the more far-fetched suspects thrown out there. Uh, artist Walter Sickert, who uh, I think we're, we may bring up again later, but apparently he painted portraits of prostitutes and poses and necklaces that sort of hinted at the fact that he may have known about the murders when in reality uh i think he was out of out of the uk during the murders but that was sort of sort of a romantic uh speculation that this artist had something to do with this oh, don't let those facts um, stop you <laughs> <laughs> and they said one of the reasons that he's a modern day uh suspect is that DNA found on the Ripper letters supposedly matched DNA uh, found on letters written by this artist, uh, Sickert, who died in 1942. But again, I think he had an alibi that he wasn't in town. So hmm. uh, we can kind of cross Walter Sickert off. And one of the more interesting names that came up, I didn't read as to why people thought he was a suspect, but author Lewis Carroll who wrote the Alice in Wonderland right, right. stories uh, was named as a suspect, Wasn't but the never only author apparently. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, the police never actually considered him a serious suspect. But I need to I need to do some digging and find out why his name came up. Uh, some other uh, suspects that I've read about in books, and some of the names are familiar to me. Uh, first one that comes up is Montague John Druitt who only lived a few miles away from the Whitechapel area and, and had been spotted in and around Whitechapel during the time of the murders. Uh, in December of 1888, his body was found floating in the Thames River. And one of the main reasons, even I guess people who knew him knew that he had some sort of mental issues, but the main reason he's considered a suspect, which is a bit of a stretch, is that the murders stopped after he his body was found floating in the Thames and had been in that river. He had stones in his pockets that kept him at the bottom until he surfaced eventually. And people are like, huh, so right after he committed suicide, the murder stopped. Why is that? And that's, boy, that's a long stretch to make to yeah. say, ah, we got our man. But these are the London authorities. <laughs> Ever since we started this topic, when we say, how did this happen? And they, like, and they would, the, the London authorities painted with such a broad brush. Yeah. That's how they could dismiss, oh, there's no connection to those Thames murders. Yeah. We'd find torsos and then these Ripper murders. And yeah. I, you think it's that, all, but also like. They, oh, significant police incompetence. Well, well, and also, <laughs> I mean, do, I mean, you think it was similar at, at the same time period in the U.S. in that 
crime fighting and crime detective, they didn't have the, the means. Oh, no. Not only did they have the means, yeah. I absolutely agree. They did not invest in forensics. For them, it's the easiest solution is the, is the simple solution. The simple yes. solution is the easiest solution. Oh, it's, it's some ne'er-do-well. Yep. And just easy. Mm-hmm. And also, the, I think Joe was talking, it was the nature of the victims. No one of high class died. Right, right. Yeah. It wasn't, so they're not going to make much of an effort. It wasn't a judge's kid I mean, that exactly. got killed it, it or It still something. happens to this day. You know, yeah. you, you know, you if, if some some random kid goes missing who's in the low socioeconomic group, they're not going to find. You take a beauty pageant, John Benet Ramsey. Yeah. Stop Everybody's the press. And, yeah. yeah, and as long as you get, can get that image out there in the media, yeah. you'll get you'll get the, the authorities to, to look into yeah. it. So. Now, here in the U.S., we had the Pinkertons who kind of, you know, investigated murders in the Wild West. But London had the Scotland Yard. So yeah. it's shocking that they lived they on a could. name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Post on a name. Another suspect, Carl Feigenbaum, was a 15-year-old German merchant sailor. He was working on merchant ships docked near Whitechapel, and records show that he was in the area on every single date of the five canonical murders. He and his co-workers were seen in the area's brothels. Hmm. He went to America in 1890, where he was convicted of murdering Juliana Hoffman in the same manner and style as Jack the Ripper, and went to the electric chair for his crimes. That hmm. puts him pretty high up on the list, I think. But yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, I'd put him high on the list because of the uh, how you ended it. There was another he'd co- he'd committed a murder in, yeah. in the United States, and then it seemed in similar nature. But the whole part of he happened to be in the area. It's London. There are millions it, of people. It's, it's a very, it's a, They're going to leave a lot of, of people d- in the d- d- area. That yeah, one of the most dense cities yeah, in like the world. You, you, but you when mean, you think he's capable of those types of crimes, right. he's you know, caught doing it and paid the price for it. And the fact that he had no alibi during these murders because he was spotted in and around Whitechapel during that time, I, I think that makes him a, a pretty likely candidate. And, and you said he was only 15 at the no, time? No, 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 54. Oh. 54 oh, year old. I'm murder. sorry. I, Not 50. I, no, no, no. I was like, man, I, I, that would be strange if it Based on everything that's students. known about him, I'd easily put him on the Mount Rushmore. Like he, may, he cracks the top yeah. four to sure. top five. Sure. Now, a very uh, familiar name to a lot of people who follow the Ripper crimes, Aaron Kosminski is a name that comes up. Uh, he was a Polish barber living and working in Whitechapel during the murders. He had a very strong hatred toward women and had homicidal tendencies. He was sent to an asylum in 1889 where he died. Um, and the name Kosminski was included among the list of suspects uh, in the police documents at the time of the murders, even though there's some speculation that the name Kosminski was confused with another name, Kaminsky, and these two characters are separate but fused together in history. But hmm. we're seeing a pattern here with the number of suspects that Scotland Yard's been able to. Are they Polish? Are they immigrant? Are they non British? Are they poor? Jewish. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Now, here's the footnote on Kosminski. I read about this fairly recently within the last few years that uh, there was a person, and, and I didn't write down all the details of the people involved, but basically someone owned a shawl that belonged to one of the victims, Catherine Eddowes, and the shawl was submitted for DNA testing and pretty much conclusively contained DNA of Aaron Kosminski. Mm. They got a DNA sample of his descendant, uh, compared it to the sample that was on the uh, shawl, and and it was like a 100% match. Oh. Now, experts dismiss it because they say that shawl has been handled by so many people over 100 plus years that it's almost impossible to prove that it's the DNA of Aaron Kosminski. But those who you know commit or uh, kind of finance this this testing and everything, they're absolutely convinced. They're like, I'm sorry, but we have our man. Aaron Kosminski is the guy, and so DNA almost conclusively proves that Kosminski. Unfortunately, was it came from the shawl of a prostitute. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, how many men had she been with? How, what, then, on top of that, what's the chain of custody? Mm-hmm. For that thing, so I'm not. No one's denying that it's his DNA. Yeah. But what is it? Yeah. Too bad they didn't have a, a black light 
I mean, yeah. If they tested for 20 other DNAs, would 20 other DNAs pop up? And then we say it's a 100% match. Sure. Yeah. So let's put him on the uh, the Mount Rushmore that you talked about. Yeah. Uh, Francis Craig was a reporter covering the murders. Now, this is fascinating, and this this could be a movie. I can see a movie based on this theory. Francis Craig was a reporter covering the murders. He lived in Whitechapel on Mile End Road, just minutes away from the first Ripper murder scene. In 1884, he married a woman named Elizabeth Weston Davies, who may have had an alias of Mary Jane Kelly. Oh. So theories suggest that, and I don't know where uh, Francis Craig met his wife, but the theory goes that when he discovered that she was a prostitute, he lost his mind, maybe kicked her out of the home. She went into the Whitechapel uh, area and used the pseudonym of Mary Jane Kelly and continued her practice. And so the theory goes that Francis Craig being outraged at his discovery kind of killed his way till he found Mary Jane Kelly. And that's when the murder stopped when he finally uh, found her. Wow. Uh, that's a fascinating theory to me. And I don't know how valid it is, but that's fascinating. And that, right. like I said, would be an interesting take to depict in a film. Uh, we talked about Walter Sickert, the artist, uh, another name that's familiar to me and, again, should be on the uh, Mount Rushmore of suspects is Dr. Francis J. Tumblety, uh, who was one of a couple American suspects. Hmm. And there's a lot of weight behind an American suspect because an American would come into town, maybe stay for a few months, and then leave, and the murders begin and the murders end. Right. So basically he was a, and these aren't my words, this is what I saw in my research, he was a quack uh, doctor from New York. His arrival in London co coincided with the start of the first Whitechapel murder. Uh, he was considered a suspect and was reportedly asking around town for body parts for medical research. Uh, after the murder of Mary Kelly, Tumblety fled the country and returned to America which, coincidentally, the murders ended after he fled back to America. Wow. So that's a name that, you know, in, in my research and readings, and I have a book at home, um, that it, that's a name that frequently comes up when you talk about possible Ripper Did they say suspects. where, what city he fled to when he came back to the United he States? He was from New York, so I yeah. assume he went back to New, New York. York. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there's some talk that, you know, murders Ripper-like murders happened in the United States after the murders came to an end in England. So the fact that the murderer may have been a suspect uh, of, or, or the murderer was an American suspect, uh, there's there's some weight behind that. Sure. So as a matter of fact, one of the articles I read said that um, at, in at least one of the letters, which I'm going to talk about here, uh, a lot of the language and vernacular in some of these letters was very Americanized and may have been written by an American. So mm. even though a lot of those letters, they haven't proven or disproven if they're hoaxes or not. Uh, one of the more famous letters is the Dear Boss letter. Yep. Uh, it was dated, uh, written September 25th, postmarked September 27th, and received by the Central News Agency. Uh, it was the first letter which uh, gave name to the murderer. Uh, it was signed by Jack the Ripper. He named uh, himself. He <laughs> signed the letter Jack the Ripper. And, the, that's and, the, the, uh, and that's the first mention of Jack. Yeah. They start calling him Jack the Ripper. So after. when the police, you know, made it, made it uh, the announcement that they had gotten this letter, the media was all over it. The Jack the Ripper. And it was the, <laughs> it's the Dear Boss letter that made me think of the suspect that was the reporter. Because mm -hmm. it had to be someone egotistical enough to name themselves. Yeah, and yeah, it, it exactly. was delivered to the press first before it was sent to Scotland. Yeah, it wasn't sent to the police. It was sent to the news agency, who then turned it over to the police. So that's really interesting. I mean, imagine if something like that were to happen today, where somebody signs, you know, like makes. Oh, a name uh, unfortunately, no criminal these days are smart enough to do that. They'll, <laughs> they'll geotag themselves on Facebook. They'll probably, they'll probably take a selfie of them doing it. They carry their phone around and yeah. uh, take pictures, trace their path.
take pictures of themselves breaking into the Capitol or, or the, like or, that. And, and then their laptop or cell phone will be how to how to how to commit murder. <laughs> right. How to yeah, get they rid of blood Google stains. that stuff. Yeah. Uh, the next letter gave uh, the name to the film you just recently watched, the From Hell letter, uh, which was accompanied by a piece of human kidney. And received by George Lusk, who at the time was a leader of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee on October yep. 16th. Um, that and, explains your, your gap in murders, because they patrolled the streets with their vigilante group for about three weeks. And mm-hmm. then after they... That makes more sense. Then they had There it. you go. Oh, they uh, very anti-Semitic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very anti-Semitic. I was, I was surprised by like the, the Jewish talk in the movie. I mean, they, I mean, it wasn't surprising for the time. I mean... Yeah, but watching it now, it's like... Oh, okay. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, police officials claim that the Dear Boss letter and the what's known as the Saucy Jack postcard uh, were written by journalist Tom Bullen. Another journalist, Fred Best, uh, reportedly confessed to writing letters and signing them as Jack the Ripper to help sell his newspaper. Yeah. So, again, all of these letters may or may not be connected to Jack the Ripper, but more than likely were hoaxes that may have been perpetuated by the newspapers. And at when you the have time. an already predominantly incompetent police force, then you add the, sens- the sensationalism of people trying to piggyback on this. It's not a surprise that this thing's still going on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so those are most of the facts from the time period. Uh, just dozens and dozens and dozens of suspects. There may or may not have been five or more murders. And, of course, Jack the Ripper was never officially named or caught. Uh, Of course, these sensationalized murders are going to give rise to movies. Uh, The most, I think, most popular, most successful movie came out in 2001, From Hell, uh, based on the Alan Moore graphic novel directed by the Hughes Brothers, starring Johnny Depp, who was amazing, as Frederick Aberline and Heather Graham, who was absolutely stunning as Mm -hmm. Mary Kelly. Yep. Uh, and our beloved hag redactor Robbie Coltrane was there. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And then and then I had to look him up to see where I had seen him, but the guy Gull who ends up yeah being the mm-hmm. being the Ripper. He's uh in home. He's but, uh yeah, yeah from the uh, Bilbo uh, Baggins. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm like, I know this guy from Bilbo. <laughs> Sir Ian Holmes. That's right. Yeah. Uh now this movie pers- pursues one of the more outlandish theories and apparently this was going around like a lot of people were passing this around that uh, the Ripper was connected to the Royal family and connected to the Freemasons. And uh, it suggests that painter Albert Sickert, who I mentioned earlier was actually Prince Albert and that he had fathered a daughter, Alice with this prostitute who would have become an heir to the British throne. Right. And so they had to quash that toot sweet. Yeah, and so that's one of the theories that the the movie and I, I don't really want to spoil anything for anyone who hasn't seen it, but um, but that's one of the more like I said colorful, outlandish theories that connects Jack the Ripper to the throne of England, which is makes for an interesting movie. Just a real quick side thing, and I I don't want to get dry. what is the official thing on spoilers when a movie's more than twenty five years old? <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say I, I did mention so- briefly something, but. Oh, yeah. uh, should we put 25 years as, as a cap? Like, if you haven't seen a movie and it's been out for 24 years, this is on you. Hey. But fine. Spoilers. That's we unfair won't... to me because I've only seen about 2% of the movies that you guys have seen. So. <laughs> Andrew, we can't put you in any statistical category. You yeah. skew the curve on many things. So. Yeah. We can spoil just about every movie that's <laughs> yeah. been made because Andrew hasn't seen it. But um, yeah, From Hell, I, when I first saw it, it was an excellent movie. Yeah, yeah, very stylish, very well done, a great performance. Um, and like you said, Joe, it it's the royal family. I mean, I'm sorry, but their mo. It's not the first heinous act that they've been <laughs> accused of in their centuries of existence. Yeah. Now, one of the things that's depicted in the movie, and I don't, I didn't see this as I was researching this, um, but one of the reasons that some people theorize that the killer was from upper crust is the discovery of grape yes. stems. Because at the time in the Whitechapel area that grapes were can only be purchased and consumed by the elite. And the right. movie kind of depicts them as a carrot, a caveat, trying to lure 
uh, prostitutes into carriages sure. because, hey, would you like to have a grape? Sure. And so that hints at the fact that the killer was from That was a fairly well-researched point because it is true. If, you, if they had the money, they would bring it down, there, spending it on grapes, and that of all the things that you would need is okay. kind of a luxury item because, yeah. mm-hmm. and then if you didn't buy the grapes to take it, then you brought the grapes down there. So someone who had means brought the grapes down there to eat. So that kind of leads in that you don't just randomly find grapes, something like that. Just, <laughs> right. Now the movie again. The movie takes some liberties, especially with Detective Aberline. Uh, the the movie suggests that uh, he dies young uh, from like an opium overdose or something. When in reality, that detective, who's based on a real life person, lived a long life. Yes. So I'm not sure why they felt it was necessary to show him die at the end. The hero um, who took the secret to the grave to protect. Yeah. Heather Graham's the wonderful Heather Graham's character. Now, the other piece of the, the, the movie that hints that or suggests that it wasn't Heather Graham's character that was murdered, it was her roommate, that stemmed from a report that after Mary Kelly's murder, friends of hers, fellow prostitutes, saw her about town after the murders. So that okay. kind of fueled this storyline that maybe she wasn't the one murdered, that maybe it was a roommate or something like that. So that has a little bit of connection to real life reports. Um, But the bottom line is movies are meant to be entertaining. A lot of historical films, they take liberties just to kind of tidy things up and merge characters and tell an entertaining story. Mm -hmm. And From Hell, in my opinion, is a very entertaining movie that uh, I might dust off when Halloween rolls around and sit down and watch it. Yeah, it it reminded me a lot of Another Johnny Depp movie that came out two or three years earlier. Sleepy Hollow. Directed by Tim Burton. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, there were very similar. Yeah. uh, (laughs) Because he, in Sleepy Hollow, he was sort of a Victorian area or era uh, detective sort of thing. Yeah. 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 So I I enjoyed it. Um, I watched it for the first time the last two nights, over the last two nights. And um, I had read that it had only a 57 percent rating on rotten tomatoes and i i I don't understand i generally agree with critic scores on on rotten tomatoes not always but i would give it like an at least an 80 i agree um very well made um the intro i just i remember the intro shot of london and the music playing i'm like this this is a good setting i like this Mm -hmm. you know uh yeah the music was great of course johnny depp was you know at his near peak and both, I guess, in my opinion, and both characters lamented the fact that their superiors and their colleagues were so myopic mm-hmm. in the way they conducted an investigation. Right, and, 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 and yeah, and they, they didn't care as much right. as in Sleepy Hollow. Yeah. Detective Ichabod, or Constable Crane was like, mm-hmm. "We have to use science. We can't use medieval methods." And then right. you have uh, the uh, Detective Avalon who was like, "Listen, you can't just say, yep, all right, some random street thug and you know did it. It's, it's not just so cut and dry." Yeah. Now, the movie was praised for its performances and authenticity, that the settings and the mood of the Victorian era were very, very authentic. And apparently they used crime scene photos to depict how these women were killed. So it's it's very authentic. And uh, if you haven't seen it, I really recommend it. Uh, Let's go way back to 1927. Uh, When you think about it, this isn't too far after the murders actually happened. Uh, The Lodger... A Story of the London Fog is a silent film directed by none other than Alfred Hitchcock, <laughs> who I was not aware did some silent films. I, I wasn't either. And I when I read that, I thought, that seems pretty early for, for Hitchcock. Like, I don't Damn. remember hearing anything of his before, like, the, sometime in the 40s. But Yeah, I'd like to find this. I'm curious. Yeah. Uh, it's based on a novel about a lodging house that exists in the Whitechapel area and a guest uh, lives at this lodging house who may or may not be Jack the Ripper. And the other people in the lodging house start thinking, is this the guy that's living here among us? Do they have have a name for the, the The character? Oh, I I don't, I don't have it in front of me, but it, I, it might be the lodger. I think the lodger might be the name of the novel. Watch, watch the author be, it was Jack. It was like he's just not. Like, yeah, I'll, I'll consult on the movie, Alfred. 
<laughs> yeah, the, the, the it was based on the book. Yep. Called Elodra, Elodra. Elodra. Do, you, do you have an author's name on there? Uh, one second. I think <laughs> I think Jack the Ripper was probably really Arthur Conan Doyle. Wouldn't that be oh, hilarious? We, we actually wow. talked about that. That he was actually once considered a suspect. Well, uh, you're looking yeah. up that information. Uh, right. This silent film was remade several times after that. In 1953, there was a movie called The Man in the Attic, uh, which is a remake of The Lodger starring Jack Palance. And apparently in this movie, it's it's fairly obvious that Jack Palance's character is Jack the Ripper. So I mean, they don't, on. They don't Jack, hit look, around. Look at Jack Palance. I've never seen that man play a hero. <laughs> you are my number one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Jack. Just, <laughs> is my voice soothing? Not at all, Jack. <laughs> Not at all. Don't read any children's books to me. So this is the woman that wrote the short story. Oh, oh. interesting. Marie Bellac Lowndes. She was from London. That'd be an interesting deep dive to do into later, but yeah. All right, so the lodger Jack that, Palance trying well, to convince us that he's the villain. The lodger, uh, she released it in 1913. Yeah, 19. so that's just not even 30 years after the murders had taken place. Mm -hmm. um, and so then it was remade again. The lodger uh, came out in 2009, and this one's kind of interesting. I might have to track this down, but it's a it's about a copycat killer set in modern times. Uh, in Hollywood, so I'm kind of, that kind of intrigues me. So, take that setting of you know a possible serial killer living in a boarding house and moving that to modern day Hollywood. That yeah. kind of intrigues me. I might have to look yeah. that up. Interesting. You got it up. Alfred Molina is in it, and Rachel Lee Cook. That's yep. a, wow. And is James Spader? I think James Spader is might be the main character, unless I'm getting him mixed up with another no. movie. No. Okay. Um, yeah, that might be a different movie. Anyways, uh, so then let's see another movie on the list called Edge of Sanity came out in 1989. It stars Anthony Perkins in a Ripper type role that sort of combines Jack the Ripper and Jekyll and Hyde. Uh, so that's kind of loosely based on, on the Ripper. I'm really shocked Hammer never took a, a shot at this. Yeah, right. With, with, yeah, that would have been a perfect horror. You have, uh, you have Cushing and you have Monster. Yeah, you said Lee. Hammer? Yeah. The Hammer, Hammer horror films. Hammer horror like, films like Dracula, Christopher Lee's Dracula. Yeah, oh, I, and like Son of Frankenstein or, you know, all those 70s era. I don't get the term ha Hammer. Or is that like the, the studio? The studio. That was the name of the studio. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. yeah. I never Hammer, Hammer Studios. You never. It's all right, Andy. <laughs> Another strike. It's all right. It's okay. Well, I learn something new every day. That's exactly. That's the pro. <laughs> now, a relatively modern movie that came out that I had never heard of, and again, I'm intrigued. I might have to look this up. Came out in 2016 called Jack the Ripper, the London Slasher. <laughs> Love that title. Um, but it's not necessarily about Jack the Ripper or some uh, Frederick Aberline trying to investigate. It's about a young woman who arrives in London with hopes of being a photographer and her brother is falsely accused of being Jack the Ripper, so she sets out to try and prove his innocence and find the real killer. Is this a period piece? So It's, it's a period the... piece, okay. but it came out in 2016. So, okay. uh, so I'm learning all kinds of new stuff. Would, I'm, I, I'm in, uh, putting these movies on my to-do list. That would be a, a good angle, a, a, yeah. a, a fresh perspective exactly. uh, for the story. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Cool, cool. Now... Uh, Something I had heard of, but I'd never seen, I started watching it last night, and I was kind of blown away from it. I'm going to try and finish it tonight, is Batman Gotham by Gaslight. Have you guys heard about this? Yes. This is fascinating. It came out in 2018. Originally, I think it was a graphic novel, comic book, um, but it's what they call an Elseworlds tale that takes Batman and puts him in different time periods, like yeah. the Old West oh, and that's that cool. sort of stuff. So imagine pitting Batman against Jack the Ripper in a Victorian era version of Gotham city. And I sat down to watch it and it was dark. Like it depicts the murders and stuff and there's swearing in it and stuff. And I was like, yeah, DC animation wow. said, has very clearly like, listen, we're not, we have the kid stuff and this is for non kid yeah. stuff. They what? just recently put another one out and it involves some secret society stuff we were talking about. Yeah, Where, where's that streaming? That sounds really. That's good. on Max, Max. Uh, because it, it's a, it, yeah. a Warner Brothers. Oh, yeah. that's right. Okay. So. Anything DC related, you'll find it predominantly on Max. Yeah. All yeah. right. Well, I, that sounds. 
Interesting. I would pay money to see this as a live action film. Ooh. Batman versus Jack the Ripper set in Victorian times. And the cool thing is, is they take his rogues gallery and Commissioner Gordon and Alfred and also pepper them uh, yeah. during that time. So cool. it's like taking that, that world, but just setting it during Victorian times. And uh, it was fascinating. And I, 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 I would have no problem with DC or Marvel doing something like that with the character. Yeah. Just to shake things up, because exactly. let's face it, I mean, not every, they put out a lot of yeah. superhero movies, and not all of them are that great, and they need a new, yeah. fresh take on them. And, but, and yeah. what I feel that DC, and to a lesser extent Marvel needs, is standalone stories. Yes. Something that's not necessarily part of this giant arc that you're trying to tell over a 10-year period. Right. Give us a standalone movie. That says, all right, this is an else world's tale of Batman in Victorian times. Begin, middle, and end, I, all in one film. I think they're trying to do that with the uh, Batman, with Robert Pattinson's Batman. Mm -hmm. that, yes, yes. It, it's a stand. I mean, they're trying to expand that universe now by making Colin Farrell's Penguin. Which I yeah. hope they yeah. do. Yeah, oh, yeah but they're exploring deeper. Like, you could do else world stuff based on that, like yeah. standalones. So that was fascinating. So check that out on Max. Uh, another movie came out. Oh, this is the one I was thinking of. 1988 called Jack's Back. This is the one that stars James Spader, uh, in another copycat tale. So it's not necessarily about Jack the Ripper, um, but it's about a person who, uh, kind of does murders in the Jack the Ripper style. Uh, and so an LA doctor is accused of, of copycat Jack the Ripper murders, but the twist is he ends up dead. So now the police are at square one, like, oh, so somebody murdered our number one suspect. suspect yeah. So um, that sounds interesting. Uh, again, James Spader's in that. Now, this is something I don't remember, and I'm trying to recall if I ever saw this in the theaters or not. Now, I loved Shanghai Noon. Did you see Shanghai Noon? Uh, of course, I'm not surprised that <laughs> Andrew's shaking his head over there. Uh, Jackie Chan, Owen yeah. Wilson. Yes. It's a period piece where they have to rescue a princess, and it was really entertaining. And and uh, Owen Wilson uh, had the – oh, what was it? He would call Jackie Chan John, John Wayne or something. Yeah. It sounded like it was John Wayne in the Old West. And I love that movie, but they did a sequel called Shanghai Nights, which I remember coming out, but I can't remember if I ever saw it. And apparently throughout the film, they run into Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, oh. uh, Charlie Chaplin, and Jack the Ripper himself. Oh, cool. Have you seen this movie? I didn't see the second one. Yeah, I'm, I have no memory of it, so I may have to revisit that mm. one. That was, so. when, that was when I was a little bit uh, leery of, of com comedy sequels because I saw Rush Hour. Yeah. And then uh, I saw Rush Hour 2, and I was like, oh, <laughs> what am I doing? You understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm kind of curious about that. Now this one's really fascinating. I remember this. I, I, if I saw it, it might've been once a long, long time ago, but this is one I definitely need to revisit. Are you guys familiar with the film called time after time? I've heard of, I've not seen this I, one. So I'm joining Andrew on this one. Yeah. I, I've only come across it just reading, but I didn't. Yeah. 1979. Too, too, too and this is a fascinating premise. It stars Malcolm McDowell as HG Wells who was having a dinner party and he reveals to his dinner party that he had invented a time machine. And, uh, it's the movie is set in 1893. Uh, well, during the dinner party, the police break in and have evidence that someone at the dinner party is Jack the Ripper himself. Well, the guy that's being accused of being Jack the Ripper disappears from the room hops into the time machine and ends up in modern times, which at the time was 1979. And the settings that HG Wells had on his time machine return the time machine to his time, basically stranding uh, Jack the, the Ripper in, I think it was San Francisco. So HG Wells hops in the time machine and gives pursuit. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, that sounds so batshit crazy, but I am intrigued. I am going to have to yeah. check that out. It looks good. I'm yeah. sorry, Constable. He escaped in my time machine. I swear <laughs> I'll go bring him back. Are you Are you qualified for this? Would you like a pistol? <laughs> that kind of reminds me of the movie Time Cop. You ever see Time yeah, Cop with uh, uh, John Jean Claude? Claude Van Damme. And what I find funny is in the movie, they they basically say there's, there's one working uh, version of the time machine 
and a backup prototype. And those are the only known working time machines in the world. Yet they establish a police force, force yeah. to protect the timeline when they're in charge of the time machine, which, of course, gets stolen by the bad guy. And I just think that is laughable. It's an entertaining movie, but So, of course, Jean-Claude has to give pursuit in the backup time machine. And he has to do the splits. <laughs> oh, man. That is such an iconic moment. I've never seen Jean-Claude Van Damme not do the splits yeah. in the movie. I love that scene when there, there's, like, water on the floor, and he realizes what's going on, and somebody goes to charge it with electricity, and he goes up and does the splits on the kitchen cabinets. So I, awesome. I, I've seen that shot. That's the only thing I know about that. Yeah. That's fair. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty <laughs> iconic. That's partial credit. We can get uh, but good news for time after time. It's got an 88%. On RT, so okay. I'm sure it's That's it worth sound, pursuing. It sounds very interesting. Yeah. And I love 70s movies, so yeah, exactly. I might have to see where it's streaming. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting because H.G. Wells is in modern time, so he's experiencing things like McDonald's for the first time and going, what the heck is this? <laughs> so, yeah, that's pretty neat. Uh, one last movie that I wanted to talk about that I kind of scribbled in here by hand uh, I, it came up during my research, uh, is Murder by Decree, another film that came out in 1979, uh, directed by Bob Clark. Do you recognize the name Bob Clark? I believe no. he directed A Christmas Story. Uh, oh, really? He, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. So he directed Murder by Decree, which, like the Batman movie we were just talking about, is Sherlock Holmes. Going there up is. against Jack the Ripper. I've been waiting for that one. That okay? That's because I was always going to say that's the one guy, and they uh, they all they, uh, there was a rumor that when Robert Downey Jr. was playing Sherlock Holmes that that was going to be a storyline. Oh, that would have been great. Him and Jude Law would go up against after the it was uh, after Sherlock Holmes too. Then it's I would Jack pay the money to see that. That'd be great. But, so Christopher Plummer of yeah. uh, Sound of Music fame is Sherlock Holmes. James Mason is Watson. And uh, they oh, go toe I've to heard, toe. And now we say, now I've heard of, I've seen this movie. I just I need to see it. I think it's available for rent on like Apple TV or Prime Video or something like yeah. that. So that's one that's on my list. But here's the interesting thing: the storyline talks about how Jack the Ripper may be connected to royalty, and that yes. a prostitute may have been impregnated by Prince. Sure. And so there's a lot of similarities with that From Hell story. Sure. But now you throw Sherlock into the mix. So that's pretty fascinating. And again, I am intrigued, and I want to add this to my must-see list. Which is, and the great. tab at irony is that because for a while, we were talking about Lewis Carroll, but Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was considered a suspect because he fit the description. Hmm. Really? Interesting. And that Sherlock type hat, it's all coming together. And it was his uh it was his colleague, uh William T. Sneed, the journalist, uh, who gave rise to investigative journalism and uh, what later became tabloid. Wow. Was saying like you, this is absurd. <laughs> wow. The fact that you're saying that Arthur Sir Arthur Conan Doyle is Jack the Ripper. I'm gonna just I'll I'll write an editorial piece of how you guys are all dumb. <laughs> now, you know, the thing about meeting the physical description, one thing I learned doing the research on this is that different eyewitness accounts describe different looking people. Some were described as being shabby. Others were a little bit more refined. So how do you definitively say, hey, he kind of looks like the guy? Like, come on. What what some of the constables were saying, well, but he writes these detective stories. He He's a thinker, so he knows how a villain would think. He, I mean, he's given rise to James Moriarty. Yeah. <laughs> now, another, another theory, which, again, is very, very far-fetched, but there are people who try to connect the Jack the Ripper murders to H.H. H. Holmes. Do you guys know who H.H. H. Holmes is? No, I don't. No. He could be the subject of a completely different podcast, he is the guy, and this sounds like something out of the movies, and you can't make this up. He's the guy who built a hotel in, I believe, the Chicago area. I could be wrong on that, but I think it's Chicago. And the he designed the building specifically to murder people in. He created rooms with only one door and no windows, My- and he would he would rent the room to like a lovely young single woman who is coming to like the world's fair from out of town. He'll give her a deal on this room. And then what he would do is while she was sleeping, he would slide in this chemical in a bowl that sucked the oxygen out of the room. She would get asphyxiated. He had these laundry chutes that went straight to the basement (laughs) 
And so nobody would see him taking these bodies out of these rooms. He would dump them in the laundry chute. They would go down in the basement. And in the basement, he would dissect them. He sold skeletons to university. Nobody questioned where he was getting <laughs> this wealth of skeletons from. And he got away with this for a shocking amount of time. And again, the, the stretch is that they're saying that after the Ripper m murders ended, his reign of terror began in the U.S. And so they're saying, well, it's it's not unfeasible that he could have made that boat trip to the U.S. and then sure. continued murders in, in America. But it's it's someone really trying to stretch uh, the connection here. But and forgive me, Joe and Andrew, I'm not, you know, a business major by any means. But when I build a Neither building and it's designed for murders. After the first couple of murders, I'm pretty sure that my tenants and people, I'm not going to go to the murder. Oh, you don't want to stay at the murder building, Bob. Yeah. But I, I, like nobody knew. And, and and think about this. He had very strange requests when constructing the building and no one questioned it. Like, why would you want a room in the center of the building that has no windows and all? And he's like, just shut up. And I'm paying you to build this building and in the laundry chutes and everything. They're like, to, it's going, yeah, don't question it. Just give me those laundry chutes. And everyone followed his orders, and he built this murder hotel, which I'm shocked has never been depicted in a movie. Some say that the Saw movies were based on his methods. Um, but I'm shocked this hasn't become a movie because it's it's stranger than fiction. Bob, did you find it weird that he had individual crematoriums right <laughs> next to the laundromat? He did. He did burn the, the remains oh, in, fantastic. in uh, yeah, in furnaces and stuff yeah, like that. I thought that, it was which, weird, Frank, but, you know, the yeah. man paid on time, and, you know, I said, hey, yeah. to each their own. You know what I'm saying? Maybe you don't want to burn it, by, uh, clean a dirty diet, but you just burn it. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, he would, he would try to single out, like I said, travelers, someone who didn't have family and friends in the area that wouldn't be reported missing. And he got away with it for a long, long time. And of course the building is demolished now, but <laughs> commissioner stay at my building. I swear to God, you will not die <laughs> and you'll find it's perfectly safe. Yeah. Now I didn't recognize the name, but, um, a long time ago, probably 20 years ago, my sister mentioned the murder hotel or whatever. And I, I remember she saying it was in Chicago but I didn't know all the details and how intricate it was. Yeah. Because at the time, my, we had just visited um, San Jose, California, where my aunt lived. And you've heard of the Winchester Mystery House? Oh, sure. Yes. There? Yeah, the inventor of the Winchester so rifle. So we, we yeah. went there, and that place is absolutely fascinating. So yeah. that started my sister's fascination with weird, like, buildings. Architecture, yeah, yeah. And then she came across that. And like I said, I, I hadn't, the thought hadn't entered my mind in 20 years, but Man, imagine a, a, yeah. a two-hour film with that. Imagine starting a construction company. We specialize in weird requests. <laughs> or even better, That's right. Uh, a TV series where each week is a different uh, Yeah, yeah. It, it could. Different. Uh, now, again, let's, those, let's those people... Let's write it, Nick. <laughs> those people that try to connect the Ripper to Holmes, they looked at passenger manifests and stuff, people coming over from the UK, and someone found the name H. Holmes on some passenger manifest and said, there it is, there's a smoking gun. But it's like, come on, that's a fairly yeah. common name. Um, but, yeah, so was H. H. Holmes Jack the Ripper? Who knows? But it's a fascinating story. Whoever it was... He knew what he was doing and was able to yeah. cover his tracks. <laughs> yeah, unless, like in the case of the one guy, you know, was was uh, convicted on a similar murder and eventually Electric paid the consequences the guy who got and got the chair. Okay. So if who knows? Maybe that... the Ripper did pay the consequences. We just don't know. And right. I will throw the laziest uh, wrinkle into this. Or maybe she got away with it. <laughs> hey, it's very possible. I don't know if witnesses depicted a, <laughs> uh, a, a Mary Kelly type roaming the streets, but um, so yeah, so that's that's pretty much what I brought to the table. Do you guys have anything to add? I was actually looking at the. It, they've done several documentaries on Jack the Ripper, and uh, I came across the name Charles Allen Cross, and it turns out that you know he was. People said that. Eyewitness, they'd seen him. He worked in the same area. It was along his route. He lived in the area, so he knew the areas. All these little, when the documentary presented it, that, that could say, okay, you know, so, oh, you know what? This guy had belongs to Mount Rushmore. And he came from an abusive family, so he fits the profile, the psychological profile, what a would-be serial killer would be. 
He had a name, Charles Allen uh, Lack, uh, Lackmer. That's what he died under, and he died at the age of 71, and, you know, people could never really place it. He lied to the police about his where, you know, about the time frame and the whereabouts, and so they, you know, the, the, in this documentary, they presented this case, and Joe, we were talking about this off air, that the way they presented it, that they had uh, a barrister say, yeah, you know, based on the evidence that we could... Yeah, this would go to trial, but that me doesn't mean that he's he's guilty. Yeah, it's just to present yeah. the evidence. Yeah, and then yeah. later on, they then they look through the documentary like, oh, they you know what they didn't say in the documentary was this happened and this happened and this happened. Hmm. Where it kind of kind of pokes holes in their theory, but but it, but it oh, but even then, even for, the, for all that part, it points down to one thing that the cops weren't interested in this. Yeah, this is not something that proper society should deal with not something that london wanted to deal with coming to the end of the century and you know advancing their cause and saying you know where are the pre- still the preeminent power they they basically operated under well since we happened upon a killing of we do have to do the 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 paperwork and process it and everything but it, there was no top down like we got, we got to get this killer well, right you know, for, yeah. instance, for i'd be very fascinated uh because i never really did a lot of research into the Lindbergh baby death oh, when yeah. that happened what what was the press saying were people saying hey you know was was congress were politicians getting involved you better solve this like we can't have this happening then we can't have the upper crust wondering if their generational their their children are going to be safe or not we can't right. have this right so what would, and then was that similar type of pressure applied to scotland yard get yeah. this done so when you have a intrepid inspector or constables like you say, hey man, figure it out and do it quick. Oh, I think the Jews did it. Wait, what? Oh, no. <laughs> yes. Like, oh my God. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, one thing that's popping into my head, and I, I want to say this is regarding that artist Walter uh, Sickert, but the one person who was doing the research and put his name out there, one of the pieces of evidence that she had mentioned that she had come across, which again makes you think maybe, is. Apparently, one of the letters that was sent in by Jack the Ripper, the stationery that was used had like a distinctive watermark on it. And somehow they found among this artist's belongings that he had the exact same stationery with the same watermark. Now, you would call that circumstantial evidence, but man, yeah. that's pretty strong. It would be but, admissible in court. Yeah, uh, definitely. <laughs> it would ha- be left for the jury to decide. Yes, yes. Given the way the the cops were, they none of them were interested in solving this. They would. They would have. I, I feel like there's no secret diary somewhere out there. I feel like they would literally have burned the evidence. Yeah. Anything that was hardcore going to be related oh, yeah. to him, and especially if it's someone to the royal family, it's gone. Yep. Thrown in the fireplace immediately. Yeah. yeah. Now we only have a couple minutes left. I did want to mention that if, and I know this sounds morbid, but if I had the chance to go to London, England, I would definitely do the Jack the Ripper tour. Oh. Even though a lot of those locations have been demolished and uh, new buildings have been built in their place, but apparently there are a couple uh, locations that have been untouched. Yeah. Uh, there's also a Jack the Ripper Museum, which I heard the locals weren't real happy about because they're sort of glorifying what uh, what Britons have uh, voted Britain's worst resident or the worst <laughs> Britain in history is Jack the Ripper. So here they are trying to glorify this ugly, ugly time period in England's history. Which I've heard people say that, like, uh, we, you know, he's the worst. Why are you glorifying the worst citizen? I'm like, it's not the worst citizen. You're right. I was like, well, you know, your royal family did do the Atlantic slave trade. <laughs> we really want to go that route. Yeah. How I mean, far he, you guys want to go? I mean, this? he murders five to maybe 20 people, <laughs> Grand and Butcherway, and then there's, you know, so let's just, let's take the tourism, take the win, take the tourism win. Now, if the uh, palace guard is hearing this, that is Imaginos Pete, not me, <laughs> saying that, yeah. naming the royal family England's worst Britons. <laughs> so contact me if you want his contact if, information. I mean, they, if you, if you have be, any uh, paparazzi they, be motorcycles behind you yeah. driving through a tunnel in Paris, oh be God. careful. <laughs> thank, thank God we haven't done the Princess Die topic. Oh. <laughs> oh, that could be another podcast, right? You, know, you talk about Hollywood crime scene. Yes. All right. So, yeah, if I get a chance to visit England, that's going to be one of my stops. Uh, yes. I just have a morbid curiosity when it comes to stuff like that. That's why we do this podcast. <laughs> so, all right, guys, that was a fascinating one. Thanks for joining me. That yes. flew by. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, yes, yeah it, it did. really did. Thanks to those of you who tuned in and listened. And Peace I hope out. you got some entertainment. And uh, we'll see you really, really soon on the next episode of Hollywood Crime Scene. Good night.
Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.